domain lead for the Regional Wildfire Mitigation Program. Um, I know many of you who have been on the board for a while have been hearing about this program and um, Anne-Marie is, um, you know, evidence within your own organization that we're starting to move forward. Um, but we just wanted to bring the full project team in front of you today, talk a little bit about our approach, talk a little bit about our objectives, um, and give uh, folks to comment um, and also open it up for questions so um, that we can get everybody leaving here with a pretty good understanding of what we're going to be doing because I think um, hopefully you'll be interfacing um, with members of our team on an ongoing basis um, over the next couple of few years. So um, down below you know you can see we have quite a few um, partners uh, local and also um, more broadly um, so we're a pretty uh, well-connected and um, well-funded project. So hopefully we'll be able to um, get out and make an impact. So first off, I just wanna introduce who the team is. Um, so it is myself, um, Anne-Marie, who introduced herself a little bit earlier. Um, so I will, I'm currently managing the landscape domain um, Anne-Marie will be managing the community domain as um, part of the Fire Safe Council. And then the built environment um, domain will be led by um, the wonderful team at the uh, communal, Community Wildfire Planning Center. Um, they'll all sort of introduce themselves, but Molly, um, Kelly Johnson, and Katie. Um, so broadly, what is the RWMP? Um, you know, we are gonna be around for a few years. Um, the first sort of phase is um, scoping, mapping, creating baselines, but we're really implementation based. Um, so, you know, the second um, couple of phases include implementation and then monitoring um, the success of those projects that we're going to put on the ground. So for me coming from um, a background um, at, places like the Land Trust and South Coast Habitat Restoration. I know that sometimes these, these big planning exercises can get done and, and sit on the shelf. And I just want to assure everyone that, um, you know, we'll be in trouble with NIFWIF if we don't get some stuff done. So um, we're really going to be trying to be active, identifying um, high priority projects and, and really driving towards implementation. And broadly, our goal is resilience. Um, you know, we want to work in tandem with the fire agencies who, as we just saw with the Alisol fire, are really good at what they do. Um, and we want to sort of work uh, in parallel with them um, to create resilience. Um, so allowing individuals, homeowners, communities, uh, and organizations like the Fire Safe Council to adapt and recover from the shocks of natural disasters. And I think as time goes on, you'll see that our approach is hopefully holistic. We'll be looking at um, various ways that to, to be involved in, in the community built environment and landscape domain to, to accomplish those things. Um, again, we have three programmatic areas, as, as I've mentioned, landscape, um, which isn't landscaping, um, but looking at the sort of regional landscape scale um, at potential projects, the built environment, um, which they'll go through, you know, that's a really complex one. I'm really excited that um, Molly and Kelly and, and Katie are involved because um, this is one that has a lot of elements to it, um, a lot of data that will, will get processed. And, and I think that they're really um, well equipped to take that on. And then obviously, Anne-Marie in the community domain, she'll speak a little bit um, more on that. And part of what we're going to try to do is prioritize projects based on their ability to achieve benefits across domains. This is a really sort of tricky, tangled um, process, but looking at how to um, envision a, a fire adapted community that enacts projects based on 
you know, some sort of net benefit. And, and I think that's really a stretch goal for us. Um, we'll obviously be doing stuff in the interim, but to come up with a process that allows us um, to look across all three domains simultaneously and, and prioritize projects is, is something we'll be um, attempting to do. So really quickly, um, you know, I put some big markers on, on our map of the study area, but hopefully um, you all have seen this. I understand many of you have been part of some of these communities for, for decades and, and know this map better than I, but um, really what we're, what we're targeting here is our, you know, Santa Barbara coastal watersheds with some exceptions um, to get those sort of Eastern Goleta mountainous communities um, and we'll be, um, you know, talking to folks from, you know, Point Conception to Rincon Creek and, and trying to understand um, what's out there as part of our baselining process and um, moving forward to implementation. But this should be a pretty good visual uh, of, of what we're, what our study area is. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Anne-Marie. Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, so I want to start off by kind of just go over what is the community domain. Um, it basically just kind of includes you, know, you your family, your neighbors, um, really the citizens of Santa Barbara County within the assessment area Graham just went over. And so the program is not just limited to residents and areas just within high fire severity areas. Um, it also includes urban areas because fire is a threat to everybody. Um, and it's important to note that this is called the community domain and not the human domain because being fire safe really is a community effort. Um, for example, when doing undefensible space around your property, it's best to do that uh, within a hundred foot buffer of your home. And so if, oftentimes that buffer extends into your neighbor's property. And so the best way for you to be fire safe is for your neighbor to do a defensible space. And the best way for them to be fire safe is for their neighbor to do a defensible space. Um, and so it really is this community effort to mitigate fire risk. And so basically I am here to help communities become more fire safe by working directly with them to build no strong networks so that they can increase their capacity to prepare, respond and recover from wildfire. The when, you know, not if a fire occurs. Um, and so to do that, uh, next slide please, Graham. Thanks. Uh, so to do that, I'll be doing lots of community engagement to educate communities, to help them understand their fire risk, um, what they can do to mitigate that risk, and also try to strengthen the community bond uh, by helping to inform people that being fire safe really requires working collaboratively with your neighbors. Um, so this requires you know, going out to speak with community members at you know, informal settings, such as just getting together with some neighbors, walking around, hearing about their experience with wildfire, um, and also going to more formal settings like at um, HOA meetings. Um, I'll also be working with local organizations to create a survey to help better understand at a broad scale, you know, things like challenges homeowners face when it comes to doing defensible space and doing home retrofits, um, among other things. Um, these will be really important information sources as we try to figure out the various barriers the many diverse communities in Santa Barbara County face and how these barriers are similar different snow when factoring in things like um, location within the WUI, um, demographics. Um, then there'll be a very strong focus on using these results to help to actively help communities um, become more fire repaired. Um, I'll also be working with communities to try and enroll them into Fireways USA which is a program started by the National Fire Protection Association to help communities get organized um, to understand the risk, which are two very important things, um, and also take action to mitigate the risk. And so what's great at FireWise is that like the community domain, they very much focus on the community scale and not at the individual scale. Um, and for now, since the RDWMP is such a new program, this will most likely be done with a handful of pilot communities, not communities that are already very aware of the fire risk and are already pretty um, organized. Um, so I would work with them to get a sense of the challenges communities face when trying to get organized or try to understand their risk. And then work with them to overcome these barriers so that other communities in Santa Barbara who are maybe less organized, less aware of the risk, um, can then also become fire waste communities and become more fire safe. 
Um, so an important part of this is just you know, identifying community leaders who can lead their community in getting them organized and getting them to do mitigation actions. Um, so if anybody listening is interested in being a community leader or knows of someone who is a community leader and is interested in making their community more fire safe, please do reach out, be excited to work with you. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Molly, uh, Katie and Kelly to talk more about the build domain. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie, and thanks, Graham, for the pre-introduction to our team. Um, just as a quick recap, I am the executive director of the Community Wildfire Planning Center. And the Community Wildfire Planning Center, or CWPC for short, is a nonprofit focused on providing planning and resilience assistance to communities, both across California and the rest of the West. So my background is actually in land use planning, and I've been focused on wildfire specifically within land use planning for many years. Uh, we're definitely excited to be part of this effort. So um, thanks again for the opportunity to also present. And for the RWMP, um, we're working CWPC as a team on the built environment domain, as Graham mentioned. So it's myself, Kelly Johnston, and Katie Oran. And so Kelly, um, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself first and then we'll go to Katie? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Johnson. I'm the operations manager for the Community Wildfire Planning Center. And I bring the background of forestry, fire behavior, fire operations uh, to the team. Um, my One of my primary goals is to be coordinating with the with the fire behavior and fire modeling component to uh, uh, connect it with our built environment domain and have the right baseline data that we need from that. Great. Thanks, Kelly and Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie. I'm a program associate with Community Wildfire Planning Center. And like Molly, I am also a planner um, and excited to jump into this project. So we know many of you are familiar with the built environment domain uh, already, but we wanted to just share a list of the types of what we call assets or values at risk considered uh, within the built environment domain. So you know, typically um, we think of structures or homes, but there are so many other types of assets that can be affected. And I think the LSL fire was a good reminder of how many other assets can be affected during a fire. Uh, we've seen this in many other uh, fire events across California within the past few years as well. So we wanted to share the list of you know, what, we'll, what we will be looking at and what we have been looking at uh, to better understand the full picture of the built environment. And then there will be different ways to understand these assets in terms of how do we assess them. So next slide. And Kelly, you can take it from here for the baseline and vulnerability assessment. Oh. Maybe I'll, I will unmute myself first. Um, we're starting off with the baseline assessment. In that assessment, really, it's a big uh, data gathering process. Um, all sorts of data, which we uh, that is associated with the list um, that Molly just presented. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a later here, um, we're going to research and analyze that with regards to the impacts that have happened, um, some of the lessons learned, and some of the reference materials that we can find from that, um, as well um, as assessing some of the current governance systems like approval plans and land use codes, building codes, fire codes, etc., and how they interact with those with the current conditions. And finally, draft a baseline assessment um, summary report from there. And from that, we move on to um, actually assessing the vulnerabilities um, of the things like housing, businesses, road networks, critical infrastructure. And so this includes some of the socioeconomic impacts and the vulnerabilities with regards to that, as well as uh, specifically some of the things you're more familiar with and what Anne-Marie brought up uh, earlier was things like building and landscaping directly adjacent to the buildings. Um, even the businesses and economic risks um, to the infrastructures with regards to wildfire threat. And, and you know, more specifically, things like power lines and, and water uh, infrastructure um, and, and the impacts that fire may have on those. 
uh, and then we move on to uh, moving forward with selecting those, uh, developing the selection process and moving into an implementation plan for the future program. Thanks, Kelly. And our next final slide here, for the built environment. Uh, do you, these are just a few of the tasks to give you a better sense of what we're working on, similar to what Anne Marie shared, what we are working on and what we will be working on. Um, so and I apologize, my camera is on. I don't think I'm appearing for some reason. So um, I don't know why, but hopefully we'll all get to meet in person someday. So, um, so with our current built environment tasks, the next steps that we're engaging in is continuing our data collection. Um, Kelly, you mentioned a lot of things for the baseline and vulnerability in terms of what we'll be looking at. Do you wanna give just a few specific examples of some of the data that we've been uh, focused on recently? Yeah, so the primary one, which is a which is a big decision support tool for us, is the is the hazard and exposure that the that wildfire presents to the built environment. So we're working pretty heavily with other members of the team, the modelers on the team, to um, work on how that that information can be best presented to provide us the information in which we can um, in, in, integrate all of the other components, the spatial components and move forward with that baseline and the vulnerability assessment. Thanks, Kelly. And by the way, Kelly, if you um, have the ability to turn up your audio just a little bit, I think that would sure. be no problem. Great. And then we were also combing through a lot of plans and regulations, uh, local ordinances and codes. Katie, do you want to give a quick sense of the types of uh, research we're going through right now for everyone's benefit? Sure, yes, we're reading through fire codes, zoning codes, CWPPs, area plans, climate action or adaptation plans, hazard mitigation plans, really trying to get a good understanding of the types of planning and governance related to wildfires and disasters that are already occurring in um, our project area and how that interacts with the built environment and wildfire risks. Thanks, Katie. Um, so like all the domains, we're working in close partnership with many stakeholders. Um, a couple of the primary groups we're working with are the fire agencies, some of which are on the phone today. And we're very grateful for all of the time they've already been giving us and expertise and insights. Um, we'll also be working with many of the local planning, um, uh, local county departments, including planning and public works and others. And we hope many of you. So. While we're um, together for site visits um, and other meetings, we hope we have the opportunity to interface as much as possible um, in either virtual or safe uh, in-person uh, opportunities. So we'll look forward to that and turn it back over to Graham. Thank you, Molly. Um, so I'll speak on the landscape domain now um, and just for everyone's um, edification. The, what we're considering the landscape domain, as I said, is the sort of regional, ecological, agricultural, and hydrologic context of our project. Um, Santa Barbara County and uh, the front country in particular has a really unique um, and historical land use um, pattern. And so we're going to be assessing the uh, location of different agricultural um, establishments, um, looking at the condition um, of various ecological and hydrological resources, you know, the unique east-west orientation of the front country. We have some huge number of coastal watersheds um, that support steelhead, red-legged frogs, um, you know, riparian esha. So we're going to be looking at all of that. Um, and similar to the built environment, we're going to be um, modeling wildfire and looking at the effects that that those wildfires have on the resources, and then looking for strategic opportunities for um, mitigation strategies. Um, and being that Santa Barbara has a high amount of privately held land. Uh, obviously, we'll be interfacing uh, on the north portion of the study area with Los Padres, but um, 
uh, the lion's share of the outreach will have to be to um, specific landowners. So um, that will be a big part of what we do to build support for um, some of these more uh, ambitious projects that we might come up with. Um, so as I said, right now we're working uh, across domains to assess and map the existing conditions and see how they are affected by wildfire risk. Again, the unique thing about this project is that we're really trying to create a, a holistic picture um, of what wildfire risk and opportunity looks like across all three domains. Uh, in the landscape domain, we'll identify um, you know, land use and project types that generate benefits to ecosystem watersheds and livelihoods um, that at a, at a base level mitigate fire risk, but can potentially, you know, incur um, benefits across uh, other areas as well. And then, you know, it's been stated multiple times, but uh, we have a, a collaborative network across the three domains. And, and I think we're all looking to continue to expand that to local and regional stakeholders and experts so that we have, um, you know, consensus and buy-in as we move this, this big project uh, forward into the future. So I sort of mentioned the various phases of the project, and um, I think it's clear right now we're sort of squarely in the scoping phase across all three domains where we're looking to gather, analyze data, look at how wildfire risk um, is going to affect the various high value resources that we identify. And at the end, we'll be looking to prioritize different types of uh, mitigation projects. Um, phase two will be implementation. Um, and some of this will be getting off the ground, especially as Anne-Marie gets started with FireWise and, and I'm looking at, at pilot projects. Um, so, you know, this is gonna be happening simultaneously in some cases, but we'll be looking again, like I said, to implement projects um, and build programs that allow uh, residents of the study area to take advantage of the resources that we make available. Um, as part of that, I think it's gonna be important for us to build in um, success criteria and metrics because the third phase, once projects have begun to be implemented, is to see what's working and what's not. Um, I think there's a lot of ideas about what can be successful in all three of the domains. And it's part of our job to um, put those projects on the ground and assess if they are working and um, you know, lean on things that are successful and reconsider things that haven't worked out quite as planned. Um, and so there will be um, data collection and, and we'll be looking to um, community leaders and, and members of um, organizations like the Fire Safe Council and County Fire for um, feedback on what they're seeing on the ground. Uh, and with that, we'll open it up to Q&A, but I wanted to throw it to um, some of our key partners, um, Nick, Elmquist, and Max Moritz, if they have um, any comments they want to add to what we've already presented. Uh, I guess I'll start. The only thing I'd say is um, I remember sitting at UCSB probably three years ago having a sandwich with Max and him brainstorming this idea. And so it's really uh, neat to see it come in fruition and um, excited to be a part of it through the Fire Safe Council. I think it's obvious, you know, from folks in the fire agencies that um, we can't do this alone. The last couple of California fire seasons are a great example of that. I think government realizes that as well. And there's a lot of funding opportunities that are going to be coming um, to fruition. They already are, and they're going to probably continue to expand for the foreseeable future. So I think the RWMP is going to align uh, the county and beyond uh, well for uh, future funding for wildfire mitigation. So I'll pass it to Max since this is kind of his brainchild, but um, appreciate the opportunity to, to add my two cents. Thanks, Graham. And I, I won't say much other than I'm really, I'm really excited, really happy to see this in front of, <laughs> in front of all of us. It, 
yeah, it was, it, it's been at least three years of, of work trying to push a boulder uphill, but it's finally here. And uh, I, I agree with Nick. I think this is going to set the stage for lots and lots of the fire safe council and, and community um, activities for, for years to come. The implementation plan, uh, we will be able to chip away at that, you know, by the end of this NIFWIF funding uh, period, but there will be uh, many, many opportunities to continue to look for for support and and ways to continue the implementation. That's really the focus of this is is doing as opposed to planning um, for for years to come. So I'm I'm thankful uh, for for the teamwork too um, with with the agencies with Nick and Rob and there the other partners, the Fire Safe Council and the the Santa Barbara Land Trust was er, an early uh, collaborator and is still on board. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm I'm really happy to see it here. Great. Thanks, Nick and Max. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll be happy. I'm going to stop screen sharing and we can open it up to questions from um, folks in the Zoom. I'd like to jump in if I could, Graham. Oh, sure, Scott. Yeah, oh, you guys, um, one thing again, we appreciated that site visit up at the Hollister Ranch. And uh, to that end, um, first off, you know, in the Community Wildfire Protection Plan for Gaviota, um, we are going to be putting in, you know, kind of the textbook example of the uh, Alisol fire. And, and there was just numerous examples of where fire prevention activities happened and it went well. And those others that where it didn't happen and it went poorly. And so we're going to be kind of putting that into the plan for sure. Of course, the built, uh, the built environment and the landscape, of course, has changed dramatically with that 17,000 acres. So we're, that'll be in that plan. And we want to coordinate that with you guys. So uh, um, well, Scott and Rob and I will be working on that. The other thing is we appreciate that site visit to the Hollister Ranch. And we have talked to uh, uh, the manager there and the board of directors. And potentially we could be a test case, you know, because we want to maybe go for that firewise uh, designation. And I've got some homeowners that on the built environment, you know, may be able to be kind of a test case for that as well. So we've got some stuff, I mean, some irons in the fire for you and kind of uh, chomping at the bit to uh, to get going on that. So I think while that that's going, maybe we can have some some meetings and, um, you know, get some of this, you know, some of the first ones set up. And then, like I say, with Molly and that, we can maybe kind of be the test case to to kind of see how how things could move forward. But we're ha happy to work with you. And uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited as well. Thanks, Scott. That's fantastic. Yeah, we'll we'll. Um coordinate and we'll circle back with you and, and start that collaboration. But thanks for, for putting in that groundwork. We really appreciate um, anybody that's got deep roots in the community, um, you know, sort of lending their expertise and, and credibility, I think is, is really useful, which is why I'm so glad we're, we're sort of rolling out to this group here. A um, lot of, lot of years in brush country and a lot of experience that I think we can pull from as we, we start to move forward. So thank you. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, Scott, that sounds fantastic. We found it's so much easier to have those fresh case study examples or, you know, local examples to call out, um, especially when we're looking at what mitigation works and didn't work. It's just as um, informative on both sides. You know, you know, and I'll, I'll just, you know, I had some conversations with Rob and uh, on that uh, Alice All Fire Boy. It's, I mean, I, I think we, we should jump on that because there are so many examples where, I mean, we've had a couple where the uh, people that, you know, did their work, the Habivory and all that, you know, and the fire was ripping right next to him, like in Gunner's case, and just went right up to his property and just the fire went out. It was just superb example of people that do you know, this kind of work, how well it works. So we, we, we absolutely have to take a, a, a advantage of those situations that occurred just, you know, like last week, that'd be, that'd yeah. be good. Well, we will be out there. Um, actually, we were supposed to be out there uh, last week or no, this week, <laughs> um, but we rescheduled because of the fire and we will be out there the week of November 8th. And so we'll follow up with you um, on how we could coordinate. Also, maybe uh, just to, to note, Ethan Turpin, who's on the call and as for the burn cycle, um, has some uh, funds available in, in this project in terms of public education. And he's been, he was out at the Alice Hall fire shooting footage and is going to continue to do so. Um, so that could be something um, he could help. 
document is uh, where wildfire mitigation actions actually uh, were beneficial during the fire suppression efforts. Yeah, I was just going to ask Scott and anyone uh, who has specific knowledge of, you know, good examples that we might capture on video um, of what did and perhaps did not really work. I, I, I did see a, a cool video from a uh, Kuyama lamb who did the grazing work on the, on Gunner's ranch or the Aurelia ranch uh, that they already showed um, some of that. So those kinds of exam visual examples would be useful for our engagement, uh, public engagement projects later on. And also just sort of in the evaluation and telling the story of the RWMP. So um, if you want to email me or uh, leave your contact in the comments, uh, we could follow up about that. Yeah, it sounds good. Maybe real quickly, Ethan, um, I was there when that fire you know, ripped up to his area. So I've got some shots for you there. And then I know Rob, you know, if we could chat with Rob, I mean, on the, the flip side, you know, some of the issues that they had um, over, you know, on uh, the other end of the fire, you know, we can we'll get together with Rob as well. <clears throat> yeah, great. You know, Ethan, I might have some footage too. I, I was watching a couple of houses, one in Tahiguas where the fire just went all the way around that, you know, pretty good defensible space. Some of those new houses on top of that hill. Um, and then also one of them over there by that olive farm. So yeah, there's, there's some pretty good examples that I noticed of good defensible space. You know, piling on, I think that the, the fire itself could be a really interesting example for the landscape domain to see where different types of ag, and Graham and I have already talked about this, where different types of ag provided different benefits, um, whether it just in and of themselves or that they, they stopped the fire or slowed the fire or they allowed defenders a, a place to safely work. But it seems like we should have a coordinated effort um, to, to, to somehow do that before, before too long. Um, and maybe, maybe we should have a, a side meeting on that with, with those people that are, you know, have firsthand knowledge, that'd be great. Abe had a question. Yeah, I, I'd like to just try to um, uh, inject something here a little off uh, what we've been talking about just recently, but, but um, I've lived in the Painted Cave area for over 50 years, and I want to say that um, I've been on the Fire Safe Council since it started, et cetera, et cetera. Very interested in the community organizations and getting the communities to be cooperative and, and work with the agencies. Um, what, I, what I'm curious about, and I'm hoping from, from, uh, from this whole, whole project we're discussing today, is that there will be some emphasis on bringing um, some of the communities that have not participated or some of the people that haven't participated in organizing them to be more focused on what the whole uh, message is that we're putting forward here. I, I, um, one of the things that we were really involved with that we started uh, the Fire Safe Council was hoping that we were going to be able to involve uh, a, a larger part of the community um, through uh, getting groups to, to, to become um, uh, community chapters and, and um, uh, community blocks and et cetera, et cetera. And it hasn't really worked tremendously well. We've got some very, um, very strongly organized communities that are part of the whole process, but the vast amount of the population that's in the wildland urban interface and connected areas across the front country here um, really are not involved and they, they haven't really uh, participated. I'm hoping that what you folks can do with all your projects is to, to have some focus on the idea of going to those communities and organizing them and get them to be participants. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Abe, you had a question? Uh, yeah, um, uh, thanks. I'm sorry I missed the early part of the presentation. I got sucked into a medical emergency this morning and uh, couldn't leave for a while. But um, the, uh, the question I had was, uh, was just in relationship to the recent fire in the <laughs> study area. And uh, one of the things that uh, I felt was a little bit of a missed opportunity after the Thomas fire, at least in, in kind of our community, was kind of really detailed biological study of the recovery of plants in this changed climate. So the ecosystem, the, the, the plant and animal ecosystem in the burn area uh, and kind of looking at that life cycle uh, from the start of the fire 
to through you know the recovery period and as you know and also the, with the intersectionality at the burn scars uh, the sherpa burn scar etc you know kind of how that how the the ecosystem is recovering and you know invasive pressure and whatnot and you know through a wildfire perspective that's important but also through um, an ecology perspective, uh, watershed perspective, there's other perspectives. And I just wondered how much of that will be included in this study. Hey, Abe, good to, good to see you again. Um, yeah, so I know um, that the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, they're another one of our partners. Um, and Steve Winhager, the executive director, Josie um, Lesage, who is their applied ecologist, have been doing some work in the burn scar, and hopefully we can, um, you know, find a way to incorporate them into what we're doing now. I, you know, I can't even begin to imagine what access looks like, but um, yeah, hopefully we can get some some folks out there because I agree. You know, one of the things that I'm hoping to prioritize is, uh, you know ecological restoration that works as a wildfire buffer. So, um, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously plenty of work has been done in, in this county um, and at UCSB about um, sort of the fire and invasive species cycle. So I think the resources are around and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to incorporate uh, that stuff as we go along. But yeah, I think with the fire just happening, I think every domain is kind of um, re reassessing their immediate sort of task list to incorporate um, as much of, of the data from this event as we possibly can. So um, thanks for the question. And, and yeah, I think uh, that that's definitely something the landscape domain is going to be investigating. Thank you. Hey, Graham, I got just one comment if I could. And sure. uh, I echo what Ted's saying, you know, we, we've got some communities going to be tough to some forgotten communities they are going to be tough to kind of you know they maybe don't have the interest or the knowledge so getting to them and trying to you know to, to garner some interest i think is going to be a tough sell but i think we can do it the other thing that just happened just to let you know um a lot of that like when when paul and i were working the fire or the alice all fire in the actual burn area in the area right around it um you know there was you know no telephone no electrical no internet internet no nothing so i was doing daily briefings with communities you know letting them know what was going on so and I, I don't know that i have a real good a good thing like what we what are we going to do about that but i mean it's real we're in the fire area you know where there's a lot there's either miscommunication or in many cases no communication uh we have thought in, in the past i know up on the hill well uh, with ted and those guys they got the the 1600 am radio um i'm kind of thinking maybe countywide that kind of a thing but but the in the the actual area when the fire is going on there's there's really a, a real tough tough problem with communication. So that is a, a, a significant central issue that hopefully you guys will be thinking about. You know, my, my only thought was the, that radio frequency, but maybe we've got some other ideas as well. So I have a, con a question. Um, I, uh, from Via Regina, uh, at the bottom of the hill uh, on San Marcos, uh, we have organized, and I think that one of the reasons we have organized is because we feel the threat of fire and have experienced fire. So I would really ask the research question, once we have an idea of how many of our real community organizations that do exist, I would like to see a correlation line with the time of the past fire, because my guess is that people who have, have experienced fire in recent history are way more likely to organize than people who haven't. And nobody wants to pay for prevention. So we need to really come up with a strategy for these unorganized communities uh, that are passive because they don't think it's going to happen to them. Uh, so I guess I'm asking a research question. Is there any correlation between the communities that are organized and fire history? And I think that that would be a very interesting way to integrate the three, the, the two different, you know, the, the place and the people to get some better picture of how communities organize around fire. 
Thanks, Victoria. Yeah, I, I know, I think Max and some other folks did some work around wildfire salience and the way that um, salience kind of decreases the longer you get away from a fire, but also risk increases as vegetation recovers. So yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I'll try to address some things one at a time and maybe call some folks in, but to, to address Ted and, and Victoria, you know, we spoke a little bit in a, in a committee meeting um, about, there are some communities out there, Scott brought up Hollister Ranch, um, Painted Cave, some of the others that are you know rough and ready as far as when a fire comes, their communities have really laid the groundwork just through their experience with fire in the past. And so those are, we're calling them low hanging fruit, but they might just be communities that need to fill out some paperwork because they're already doing the requisite activities for Firewise. I think there are gonna be difficulties in every domain. And, you know, there's a compounding difficulty with inactive communities because they may not identify as communities. And so um, I agree, Anne-Marie will, will be working on, on mechanisms for identifying and hopefully building um, networks and capacity within those communities that are uh, somewhat inactive. As far as um, Scott's comment about communications, I'll sort of throw that to Molly and her team if, if they have experience um, just kind of working in a landscape like that. But what I wanted to point out is that's where the benefit of a structure like the RWMP comes in, because that seems to cross pretty clearly between community and built environment. So if we can come up with strategies that address both simultaneously. Um, then after an incident, the community can know what to do in a case where they lose um, you know, services like phone, internet, um, but also Molly's team will be working on how to make those resources potentially more resilient. So um, again, if we're able to address um, these things across domains, I think we'll see a, a higher degree of success. Molly, or Ke I see Kelly unmuted if you wanted to comment on that. Uh, sure, I can. I think, think you touched on it, Graham, but um, you, we're certainly in the built environment domain with the infrastructure. Communication infrastructure is one of the, one of the vulnerabilities we'll be looking at. Um, you know, because we knew this is, this is not unheard of and actually fairly common with wildfires, as many of you know, communication loss is, is fairly typical on a large fire. Um, and it can be either due to power failures or power interruptions or actual, actual impacts on, on the actual commu communications um, infrastructure itself. So from our perspective, from the built environment, We'll be looking at that, and as Graham said, the resilience of those of that infrastructure. And in uh, the second part of Graham's question, sort of, I think more moves over into Anne Marie's world with the um, with the community um, piece. Molly, I don't know if you had any other comments on that. No, I think it just underscores that Scott, it would be really helpful to make sure we coordinate um, for our next site visit, and maybe we can dig into that topic a little bit more too especially while it's fresh in everyone's uh, experience. So if I could say something about that, um, in our community, uh, we have an emergency. It covers Highway 154 mainly, and it's for emergency communication along the Highway 154 corridor. Uh, I have a transmitter and, and, a, and a repeater on my property that goes out to a, a, a large larger area than, than just that part of it. And I know that the, the County of Santa Barbara is now involved in installing, I think uh, four or five of those transmitters around the county. They're not tremendously expensive and they're incredibly effective because you can have uh, portable units that can be moved in times of emergency. And also these units are battery operated so they don't go down when the power goes off. And it's, it sends messages out to everyone in the area that they are involved in. So um, that's, that, that's a system that's already in place. And I think that the county fire is aware of it. And of course, the rest of the uh, county administration folks um, have provided for it. And it's something perhaps that uh, we could look into for the communities as Scott saying that don't, and, and do some research on, on the communities that don't have communication under the circumstances we're talking about. 
Thanks, Ted. Um, Loy, I saw your message in the chat and I'll just circle back with you and we can have that discussion. But yeah, to Phil's, um, Loy was asking about um, just, you know, beginning to think about how projects might get on the ground, prescribed grazing. Um, we can chat about that. But yes, trying to think about how to fund projects going forward. I think this is a really important piece of the RWMP as well with regards to its close connection to the Fire Safe Council. Um, I think from the RWMP perspective, we have the ability to fund some projects, but I think a big goal of ours is when the RWMP funding period through NIFWIF lapses, um, that we have created a transition so that the capacity that we build will hopefully be taken on um, I think it would be our hope that it would be the Fire Safe Council as they're sort of growing and expanding their capacity, um, bringing on staff. Obviously, um, if that if that doesn't work out, we'll we'll find a way to make um, that infrastructure that we create through the RWMP um, persistent after the this funding cycle is over. Abe, you had your hand raised. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to make a comment here. The word community has been used over and over and over in these discussions. And I think it's important for you to, to investigate those issues that erode community. Airbnbs and vacation rentals are destroying some of the community sense of community within our own community. And I think it's important to take that into account because they simply don't care about fire safety. They just care about taking as much money out of the community as they can get. So community is an issue that you need to consider and think about. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. I know, again, Molly and Anne-Marie will both be looking at, um, their teams will be looking at ordinances and zoning. So I think there's an element of that. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think there are many subtleties to the um, evolving idea of community, especially the way things are shifting um, with folks coming in and out um, throughout the pandemic that maybe haven't been um, in these in these places as long as um, some other folks. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely circle back. And again, like I said, involvement with the Fire Safe Council and, and your, your all's awareness of these sorts of issues will, will be key. Um, Abe? Did you have yeah. something? Okay. What? No, is my hand up? I wonder if that was uh, <laughs> just from before. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I think I speak for the whole team when um, I say that we're really excited to be in front of you all and hoping um, to keep the conversation up and going. Um, I think a good point of contact for folks, at least initially through this group, um, can be Anne-Marie, we're getting um, and she can, well, we can distribute our emails. If you think you have a domain specific question, um, we can make sure it's funneled to the correct person. Obviously, Scott, you've, you've sort of um, interfaced with us a little bit, but we're happy to um, begin working with anyone here um, on any of these issues and, you know, expect to see us um, out in the communities a little bit more. Um, just another plug that Molly and her team will be in town on the week of the 8th, um, and you may see them out and about. Um, and so, yeah, we're hoping to, uh, you know, make make use of the experience in this group and, and begin to push things forward. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to circle back at future meetings and, and provide updates. And um, until then, we, we look forward to working with you all.